Hi everyone, it's Professor Permiton, and today we're going to finish up our discussion on logarithmic functions. So in the previous couple of videos, we talked about how to convert from logarithmic to exponential form and vice versa, how to convert from exponential form back to logarithmic form, how to evaluate logarithmic functions, how to determine the domain of a logarithmic function, and how to graph a logarithmic function by plotting points, and also using the transformations to obtain the graph from its basic function y equals log base a of x. In this video, we're going to talk about the use of the common and natural logarithmic functions. So let's talk about the common logarithms. Whenever there is not a base specified on a logarithmic function, it's assumed to be base 10. So the definition of a common logarithm, a logarithm with base 10 is called a common logarithm, and it's denoted by omitting the base such that log base 10 of x, you omit the base base 10, and you just write log of x. The base is assumed to be 10 when it's written as log of x. So the common logarithm has the same properties of any logarithmic function where the base is greater than 1 because the base is 10. And the graph will have a very similar shape. The domain of a logarithmic function with base 10, the common logarithm, the domain is still 0 to infinity but not including 0. The range will be from negative infinity to infinity just like with any logarithmic function with a base a that's greater than 1. You have an x-intercept at 1 comma 0 because log base 10 of 1 is equal to 0. It's 10 to what power will give you 1? Well, it must be 10 to the 0 power gives you 1. And also notice that you pass through the point 10 comma 1 because log base 10 of 10 is 1 because 10 to the first power will give you 10. So notice that the graph will increase without bound as x approaches positive infinity. But as x approaches x equals 0 from the right side, the y values decrease without bound. And that's because you have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 or the y-axis. The common logarithm function can be evaluated using scientific or any graphing calculator, and it corresponds to the exponent on base 10 that will give you the argument of the logarithm, which is x. So on a graphing calculator, you'll notice that log is actually part of the graphing calculator or any scientific calculator. This log button on your calculator is a base 10 logarithm. So whenever you insert a value into this logarithm, it is base 10 to what exponent will give you what number you're actually inputting into your logarithm function. And this is why it's called the common logarithm. So scientists model human response to stimuli, such as sound, light, pressure, using logarithmic functions. That's one of the applications of the common logarithm. In the following example, we're going to see an application of the common logarithm that involves the intensity of sound. So example 7, common logarithms and sound. The psychologist, Gustav Fechner, came up with the formula, s is equal to k times log, and that's base 10 logarithm because there's no base indicated on the logarithmic function. So it's k times log, base 10, of the quantity i divided by i sub 0, where s is the subjective intensity of the stimulus, the sound, i is the physical intensity of the stimulus, and i sub 0 is the threshold physical intensity. k is the constant that is different based on the sensory stimulus. So in this example, we're going to find the subjective perception of a piano, so we're going to find out what is the value of s, in decibels, whose physical intensity, i, is 100 times that of the threshold physical intensity, i sub 0, and k is given to us as 25. So it says that i is 100 times that of the threshold physical intensity, i sub 0. That tells us that i is 100 times i sub 0, or i is equal to 100 times i sub 0. That's what this sentence actually states. So let's substitute this information into our formula that actually tells us what the capital S, which is the subjective intensity of the stimulus. So capital S is equal to k times log base 10 of the quantity i divided by i sub 0. Well, if the i is equal to 100 times i sub 0, let's make that replacement. S is equal to k was 25, that was given in the problem. So it's 25 times log base 10 of the numerator is 100 times i sub 0, or 100 times the threshold physical intensity. And then the denominator is i sub 0. So you have an i sub 0 factor in the numerator and also in the denominator. Those factors cancel out or simplify to just 1. And so you have 25 times log of 100. It's what power or exponent on base 10 that gives you 100. The exponent must be 2. So log of 100 is 2. So 25 times 2, which gives you 50. So the subjective intensity of the stimulus is 50 decibels for this piano. If the physical intensity i is 100 times that of the threshold physical intensity i sub 0, and k is 25. So that information was about the common logarithm and also an application of the common logarithm. Now let's talk about the natural logarithm function. Of all the possible bases for logarithmic functions, it actually turns out that the most convenient choice for the purpose of calculus is the number e, which we've encountered previously. So the definition of the natural logarithm function. 
The logarithm with base e is called the natural logarithm and is denoted by ln, such that this is the notation. Natural log is ln of x, so natural log of x is equal to a logarithm function where the base is this number e, which is approximately 2.718281828485 and so on. It's an irrational number e. And then you have log base e of x. So the argument are the same. They're both x. But you can abbreviate log base e logarithms as ln to represent that as a natural logarithm. So notice that the natural logarithmic function y equals natural log of x is actually the inverse function of the natural exponential function y equals base e raised to the x exponent. So if you have a base e exponential function, the inverse of that exponential function is a logarithm function with base e, and that is the natural logarithm function. We can actually switch back and forth between the logarithmic form and exponential form like we talked about previously. So if you have y equals natural log of x, so this is y equals log base e of x, this is in logarithmic form and it stands for, as this expression using exponents, it's base e logarithm, so base e exponential expression, raised to the y exponent, what the logarithm is equal to is the exponent, it's equal to what is the argument of the logarithm. So exponential form would be x equals e to the y exponent to represent y equals natural log of x. Sometimes it's convenient to express it in logarithmic form, and sometimes it's easier to express it in exponential form. It just depends on the situation. So example eight, we're going to evaluate natural logarithms. Convert each expression in exponential form to an equivalent logarithmic form. So number one, e to the negative two power is equal to about 0 0.135. So this is an expression involving exponents, so it's an exponential form. Let's convert this to an equivalent logarithmic form. So notice that the base is e, so we'll be expressing this in terms of a natural logarithm. So the natural logarithm of what the answer is, is the argument of the logarithm. So 0 0.135 is the argument of the natural logarithm function, and it equals the exponent, which is in this case negative 2 from the exponential form. So logarithmic form to say the exactly same thing as e to the negative 2 exponent is about 0 0.135 would be natural log of 0 0.135 is about negative 2. All right, number two, let's say e to the pi, which is approximately 23.141. This is the exponential form because it has base e raised to the exponent pi, and it's equal to about 23.141. If you want to change this to logarithmic form, it will be a logarithm function with base e, which is the natural logarithm function. So natural log of what the answer is, 23.141, is the argument of the logarithm, and it equals the exponent from exponential form. So that's equal to pi. So natural log of 23.141 is equal to pi. And that is in logarithmic form now. So let's try two more. Number three, e to the zero is equal to one. So in other words, base e raised to the zero power will give you one. That's exponential form. How can you say the exactly the same statement using logarithms? Well, it has to be the natural logarithm because the natural logarithm is a logarithmic function with base e. So we have an exponential form with base e. We'll use the logarithm base e, so that's natural logarithm, of the argument 1 must equal the exponent 0. So natural log of 1 is equal to 0, and that's the equivalent logarithmic form for the exponential form e to the 0 equals 1. And then number 4, you have e to the first power is itself e. Well, that's exponential form because it involves the exponent 1 on base e. Well, again, if you want to write this using an equivalent logarithmic form, this would be a logarithm with base e. That's the natural logarithm. So natural log is already base e logarithm. The argument is what the exponential form is equal to. So that's e. So natural log of e. This is saying e to what exponent will give you e? Well, the exponent has to be 1. So natural log of e is equal to 1, and that's the equivalent logarithmic form for the exponential form e to the first power is equal to e. If we substitute a equals e and log base a of x with natural log of x in the properties of logarithms that we talked about previously, then we actually obtain the following properties that involve the natural logarithmic function. So the theorem is properties of logarithms involving the natural logarithm this time. Suppose that e is the natural logarithmic base, then we have the following statements. Number one, we just found out from the previous example that natural log of one is equal to zero. That's always true. It's e, base e, to the zero power will always give you one. So the natural log of one will always be equal to zero. Number two, we also found out that the natural log of e is equal to one because this is the natural logarithm, so that's a logarithm with base e. Base e to the first power is itself, it's e. 
And so this is natural log of e will always be equal to 1. And then number 3 is natural log of e to the x. Because the natural logarithm function and base e exponential function are inverses of one another, you have a composition of two inverse functions of each other. They'll undo each other. So you just are left over with the input variable x left over. So the natural logarithm is a logarithm base e, and you also have an exponential function as part of the argument that also has base e. Well, they'll undo each other, and you just have x left over. In other words, you must raise base e to the power of x to get e to the x power. And then number four is just the opposite. This time you have base e raised to the natural log of x exponent. So natural log of x is a logarithm base e of x. These are inverses of one another, so they'll undo each other again, and you're just left over with the input variable x back. So in other words, you must take natural log of x as the power to which you have base e raised to obtain x. So these last two are composition of two inverse functions, log base e, which is natural log, and you also have base e exponential expression. They'll undo one another, and you just have the input variable x back. So these last two are going to be very important when we actually start solving exponential equations involving an exponential function with base e, and also solving logarithmic functions that involve the natural logarithm, which is a logarithmic function with base e. So one more thing about a scientific or graphing calculator, you'll also notice that right below the logarithm with base 10, the common logarithm, you'll have ln. That is the logarithmic function with base e, or the natural logarithm. So you can evaluate the natural logarithm for any input variable as long as the input is a positive number. A logarithmic function must have the argument greater than zero. So after you input the value of x, if the argument is positive, then you can evaluate using either logarithm base 10, the common logarithm, or you can also use natural logarithm with its base e. So if you want to find out that natural log of 1 is equal to 0, you'll have natural log of 1. So this is a logarithm with base e. It's base e to what exponent will give you 1. The exponent must be 0. Or if you want to verify that natural log of e is equal to 1, you can do natural log of e as your argument for the natural logarithm. And this is equal to 1 because log base e of e will be 1. Base e raised to the first power will give you e. So let's finish up this video by talking about example 9, finding out the domain of a natural logarithmic function. So determine the domain for each of the following logarithmic functions. Express your answer using interval notation. What is the vertical asymptote in the graph of the logarithmic function? So number one, we're going to find out the domain and the vertical asymptote for the function f of x, which is the natural logarithm function, of 2 subtract x subtract x squared. So 2 subtract x minus x squared is the argument of the natural logarithmic function. So since we know how to find the domain of a logarithmic function, this is a logarithmic function, but it's base e. So we know that the base has nothing to do with the domain of the logarithmic function. What is important is the argument of the logarithm must be a positive number. So we need to solve the inequality, 2 subtract x subtract x squared. Where is this argument greater than 0? So if you rearrange the term so it has in descending order of degree, you have negative x squared, subtract x, plus 2. Where is this expression greater than 0? So let's call the left side a polynomial function. So we'll call p of x, which is the opposite of x squared, subtract x plus 2. We're going to find out what are the real zeros of this polynomial function, and then construct a sign chart to find out what values of x will make the polynomial function greater than 0, or where is the polynomial function graph above the x-axis. So if we want to find out the real zeros of this polynomial function, we need to set it equal to 0. So negative x squared, subtract x plus 2 equals 0. So factor out the negative from the negative x squared, so that way you have positive x squared. Factor out the negative from the second term will leave you with plus x. And factor out a negative from the third term, you'll be left with a negative 2. So the opposite of the quantity, x squared plus x subtract 2, is equal to 0. Well, x squared plus x minus 2, that's a trinomial. See if you can factor this. Two numbers that multiply to negative 2, and the same two numbers need to add to positive 1. Well, that's positive 2 and negative 1. So you have a negative on the outside, and the two factors at work that actually will factor x squared plus x minus 2 are x plus 2 as one factor, and x subtract 1 as the other factor. And this product is equal to 0. Well, the negative 1 that we factored out, that cannot be 0. So you can ignore it when you're solving this polynomial equation. But x plus 2 could be 0, or x minus 1 equals 0. So x equals negative 2, that's a real 0 for the polynomial function, or x equals 1. So now we're ready to actually solve the polynomial inequality. We're going to make a sign chart or number line with the values x equals negative 2 and x equals 1 identified on the number line or sign chart. So x equals negative 2 and x equals 1 will divide this number line or sign chart up into three different regions. 
x values to the left of negative 2 or less than negative 2, x values between negative 2 and positive 1, x values that are greater than 1. So choose test values for each of these three different subintervals. We'll choose x equals negative 3, x equals 0, and x equals 2. These values go into the polynomial function that we identified earlier, p of x, which is the opposite of x squared, subtract x plus 2. So if you substitute in negative 3 as your test value, you'll find out that the output value is negative 4. So your y value is negative whenever the x value is negative 3. So on the left side of x equals negative 2, the y value is negative. That means you're below the x-axis. Now let's check the next test value. So whenever x is equal to 0, if you substitute 0 into this polynomial function, the output value will be positive 2. So the y value is positive. That means you're above the x-axis between x equals negative 2 and x equals 1. And then the last test value, x equals 2, if you substitute this into the polynomial function p of x, you'll find that the output value is negative 4, which means that the y value is negative, or now you're below the x-axis on the right side of x equals 1. So the solution to the inequality, opposite of x squared, subtract x plus 2, greater than 0, we're looking for where are you above the x-axis, so where your y values are positive. Well, that occurs between negative 2 and 1. So you cannot include x equals negative 2, and you cannot include x equals 1, because we want a strictly above the x-axis here. So the solution to the inequality would be the domain of the original function, so it's negative 2 to 1, not including negative 2 and not including 1. So you use parentheses for both. So that would be the domain for this original function, f of x, which is the natural logarithmic function of 2 minus x minus x squared as the argument of natural log. Now let's try one more. Number two, we have the function g of x, which is the natural log of the quantity x plus 1 divided by x subtract 2. So again, it's a logarithmic function. It doesn't matter what the base of the logarithmic function is. What we're interested in is the argument of the logarithm must be a positive number. We're going to find out what x values, if we substitute into this function for the argument, will actually make it a positive value. So we're going to solve this rational inequality this time, where x plus 1 divided by x minus 2 must be greater than 0. So we'll call the left side x plus 1 divided by x minus 2. We'll call it lowercase r of x, the rational function. And so if you want to find out where are the real zeros for this rational function, it's where this entire fraction is equal to 0. Well, a fraction is equal to 0 if the numerator is equal to 0. So that means x plus 1 equals 0, or x equals negative 1. That is a real 0 for this rational function. However, we know that a rational function could also change sign whenever you are on opposite sides of the vertical asymptote. We also need to find out what is the vertical asymptote for this rational function. So notice that x plus 1 divided by x minus 2, this is already in lowest terms, so you have no common factors in the numerator and denominator. So what makes the denominator 0 is going to make the entire function undefined. So x minus 2 equals 0 tells you that x equals 2 is a vertical asymptote for this rational function, lowercase r of x. So again, we have two different values of x that we need to identify on the number line or sign chart. We have x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 2. So x equals negative 1 is a real 0. However, x equals 2 is a vertical asymptote. So we'll use a dashed line through x equals 2 on our number line so that we can omit x equals 2 as any part of the solution set. So again, these values, x equals negative 1 and x equals 2, divide up the number line into three different pieces or subintervals. x values to the left of negative 1 or less than negative 1, x values between x equals negative 1 and x equals 2, and x values that are greater than 2. So we'll choose test values of x equals negative 2, x equals 0, and x equals 3. These values go into our rational function, lowercase r of x, to find out is the rational function greater than 0 or is the rational function less than 0? Is it above the x-axis or below the x-axis on each subinterval? So whenever x equals negative 2, you'll find out that r of negative 2, if you substitute that value in, you'll get positive 1 fourth. So on the left side of x equals negative 1, we're above the x-axis because the y value is positive. If you have x equals 0, r of 0 will give you negative 1 half. So the y value is negative on the portion between x equals negative 1 and x equals 2. So now you're below the x-axis between x equals negative 1 and x equals 2. And now the last test value, x equals 3. If you substitute 3 into the rational function, you'll have positive 4. So now the y value is positive. That means you're above the x-axis whenever x values are greater than 2. So now we're ready to actually solve this inequality. Where is this rational function greater than 0? Well, that occurs when you're above the x-axis. So that means your x values must be less than negative 1, or your x values must be greater than 2. So that would be the interval from negative infinity to negative 1. I do not include x equals negative 1 because I'm looking at a strict inequality. Where are the y values only positive, or where is the graph above the x-axis? Union 2 to infinity. And again, you can't include x equals 2 because that was already a vertical asymptote. So this would be the solution to the inequality. It would be negative infinity to negative 1, union 2 to infinity, each with parentheses. 
And so since we're solving the inequality because we're talking about domain, the domain of this function g of x, which is natural log of x plus 1 divided by x to track 2, that's the domain for that function. You can only input x values that are in this solution set or this domain. So this finishes up our video on talking about the common logarithm and also the natural logarithm functions. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about laws of logarithms.